When you dig into the pantheon of what we've collectively decided to call boomer shooters, there are plenty of obscure titles that come to mind. Rise of the Triad is probably the most prominent example at this point. But one that kept coming up and that I consistently overlooked was Chasm the Rift. And the reason I overlooked it is actually pretty simple. General consensus. The general consensus about Chasm the Rift was that it's a Quake-like that fails to deliver when compared to Quake. That the mouse movement is kinda weird, and honestly, that's about as far as I went at the time. Generally underwhelming. It's a pass from me. And then I was given a key to the recently released port of Chasm the Rift and I said, why not? I'd seen the developer mention on Twitter that the team had to break down the DOS version and then rebuild it from the ground up, which is more than a commendable effort. I don't think I have to tell anyone who actually does programming, but for those that don't, that's a lot of work. Dave Zemanski and the creator of Prolt, whose name I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce, were both influenced by it. So I curiously launched it, fully anticipating to be wholly underwhelmed. The last report on its status contained data showing a progressively increasing leak of electric energy. And that was the beginning of the cycle I'm calling Not Playing Chasm Years Ago Hysteria. Okay, let's set a baseline. This is completely rebuilt, ported, and remastered all at once, so it isn't fair to compare the attitudes people had to the original DOS release to this version, even though the opinions on the former might alter the perception of the latter. I mean, it was the 90s. Everything in the 90s was about leaps in gaming technology. It was the entire basis of the SNES vs Genesis arguments on the playground, like the Bit Wars, for example. And the push towards a truly 3D environment was instrumental in the construction of the dominant PC shooters of 1996, Quake and Duke Nukem 3D. Enter Chasm the Rift just one year later. Developed by Ukrainian studio Action Forms, it was released on DOS to insignificant media attention in North America, where I currently live. And for all the comparisons to Quake it gets, I'm actually going to be the annoying, well actually guy and disagree. Well, kinda. I get the comparison to Quake, I'm not aiming to be a complete contrarian here. Both games feature grungy, dark color palettes, crusty, marine-filled tech bases with block-headed cannon fodder, a space marine trope protagonist that says <laughs> every time they jump, and weird enemy creatures from incomprehensible extraneous worlds unfathomable to the human mind. Except in Chasm, when the human minds in the story fathom it. Oh, do they fathom it. But, that's essentially where the comparisons end. The prime attribute of Quake, that sets it apart from every other game of the era and went on to elevate things like esports and competitive FPS, is the fluidity of the movement. Moving in Quake is a prime joy, and we all know that. It's one of the first games to launch the concept of esports, and we all love it for that. The visual and conceptual parallels are basically where potential comparisons stop. Like there's some crossover for weapons, sure, but you could say the same for all FPS games of the era. And Chasm's weapons are, as a whole, unique and feel distinct from other genre parallels, say for maybe like the Volcano, which is just the bastard offspring of the chain gun and the nail gun. Where the past begin to sharply divide is in the atmosphere, aesthetic, and character of each game. Where the blockheaded space marines of Quake's tech bases elicit that 90s era of PC gaming sense of realism, and I use the word realism with the hardest air quotes possible, Chasm the Rift doesn't pretend to care about realism. Because while you might see the soldiers in this game as analogous in concept at first glance, when you put them side by side, there's something that seems intentionally otherworldly and alienating about them. The Grunt just looks like a dude with a bunch of blood and dirt all over him. The Mong, Stratos, and the Faust, by contrast, all invoke Red Scare nuclear wasteland horror like that displayed by Stalker, Shadow of Chernobyl. Like, look at this guy. This is the Stratos. This dude shoots rockets out of his feet that home in on you. The Faust just looms over the player from far away with a bazooka on his shoulder, heavily armored and through a dead-eyed soul-piercing stare that's honestly surprisingly unnerving. It reminds me of that scene from Doctor Who with the kid in the gas mask, but if the kid were never saved and he grew up and there were a lot of them. The Enforcer indulges a bit more in this aesthetic, but I think it's the brown suit and the showing skin that diminishes the effect for me, I don't know. The alien enemies are definitely more consistent in Quake. We all love the Fiend, the Vor, and the Shambler, my favorite design of which being the Vor. Whereas in Chasm, the alien enemies are mismatched aberrations of normal people throughout time and corruptions within the timeline. Or something like that. I didn't really pay attention to what these dudes were saying. But they seem to be mixed with animals, effectively becoming chimeras. So you go from this dirty, atom punk meets horror aesthetic to... Egypt. 
And this should have been the point where I said, oh, all right, the sudden shift in aesthetic tone is why most people drop episode one. I understand now. But I didn't say that, because for some reason it works for me. I will admit, this is the lowest part of Chasm in my eyes. The enemies are much less interesting than they are weird. Here's another Quake comparison, the zombie enemies. But instead of flinging skin at you, they hit you with this. Which makes these zombies a little bit more interesting to me than those in Quake. Sorry guys, I'm not the one who made the Quake comparison. The Lion Man and the Gross are pretty dumb though. The Lion Man is a bullet sponge that runs up and tries to bash your face in, which is what I expected from the Gross as well, but they also throw rocks at you. Anyway, these guys are way easier and more boring than everything else in the game, so next. This is where we get really fun and weird again though. Because this is 50% atmospheric horror game, 50% bizarre historical fever dream, and the fever dream begins with my favorite enemy in the game. The Joker. This stupid fucker. The wiki describes it thus. Jokers are gremlin-like creatures wearing jester attire. They have green skin and large, sharp jaws, and they make a panther-like growl. They attack with blade gun. So no, I have no idea what the logic is behind this guy. And that almost seems to be the logic. He's the Joker. There is no logic. He's a clown meant to die for your amusement, you fucking psychopath. Or maybe I'm just overthinking it, I don't know. Something I haven't mentioned yet, but will again shortly, is that Chasm the Rift features this fantastic ability to blow off enemy limbs. And yes, that is present in the DOS version too. Watch how amazing this is. Then we have the lumbering bullet sponge BDSM daddy, the Punisher. I don't even think I've ever gotten hit by one of these, just shoot his arm off and then his head. The Werehog, which is also bullet spongy, except it's also fast, a relatively small target, and travels in groups, usually two on normal and four on hard. The Skeleton, which is a corrupted knight who will shoot fireballs at you and can still fight without its head. And the Viking, which is a boring on normal and fucking devastating on hard. They're big, have three attacks, are fast, and can come in swarms. Then by episode 4, we're back to alien horror. The Mincer reminds me heavily of the runner and then will swarm you in groups with relative ease. And the sound they make is legitimately unnerving to hear, since they often hide in the dark. <laughs> meaning that you'll hear them well before you've seen them. The alien warrior also gives me xenomorph vibes. They're tanky and they shoot lasers at you, so blow their arms off and pop them in the head. And then there's the alien captain, aka the thing you shoot with the rocket launcher or the surrogate BFG. It's big, has a shitload of health, and has arms equipped that are essentially laser miniguns. And sometimes, the game will surprise you with two of them. Now Chasm has five bosses between the base game and the three level add-on, and I like them a lot. Each one has a gimmick that, unless you understand what is going on, will allow you to dump out your entire arsenal to zero success. I'll give you a hint on the first, and then you can figure out the rest. This guy, who is called a sarcophagus for reasons, needs to be sucked into the fan. When the prompt tells you to hide, you need to listen. Especially on hard, where he'll effectively one-shot you at full health with a direct hit. So yeah, there's a little crossover here with Quake's gimmick boss at the end of the first episode, but to say it's like Quake is sort of unfair to Chasm, especially when this is far from the biggest dividing line. And now we come to the biggest difference in what I like the most about Chasm the Rift, the level design, and the pace it forces the player to take. So Quake is really an early movement shooter, and you can debate that all you want in the comments if you prefer. It's very clear that they wanted precise movement mechanics and distance placement to be the core of the game to show off Carmack's new engine technology and more complex projectile usage. The maps are generally more open than Doom, the movement and aiming is more freeing and thus requires more skill from the player, which is probably why Quake had to be less brutal than Doom on the whole. And it's built around a true sense of verticality. This is what makes Quake stand apart from all contemporaries, and why concepts like Deathmatch became staples of the genre as a whole. You can play it as a cover shooter if you want, and sometimes you have to to break the line of sight, but that's not really showcasing Quake's strengths, more highlighting flaws in your own movement skill. It's also probably why community opinions on Chasm are so divided. Chasm the Rift is like a crazy European dominatrix whose job is to take your money and then step on your balls and spikes to let out. Every encounter has the potential to be a yes mistress scenario and it will fucking punish you for your mistakes. First, I'm going to recommend two playthroughs. Normal to learn the baseline set of mechanics between Chasm and Quake, and then hard for what I think is the quintessential and accurate Chasm experience. I previously mentioned, Chasm leans into horror as a mechanical concept more so than Quake's largely atmospheric one. This is reflected in the gameplay differences. Quake wants you to fly, Chasm wants you to quake in your boots. 
Heh. <laughs> Every enemy in Chasm is designed to suppress you in its own unique way, pushing you back and boxing you into a corner instead of squaring up with you. Except for the scorpion, I think that was just to take an obligatory weird animal enemy box. And this horror element is enhanced by the map design. You're probably seeing that I have the mini-map open for a large majority of these clips. That's because the level design is convoluted, especially as your progression in the game furthers. It's almost like an extremely early take on first-person Metroidvania, with windows and destructible walls that you have to blow open in order to progress. Which seems pretty obvious from a modern viewpoint, but in the early icons of the FPS catalog, breaking open windows would generally lead to a secret. And backtracking in Chasm isn't an occasional trait. At their certain point, it becomes the way things are done in general. And maybe I'm just uniquely stupid, but I found myself getting lost constantly, but in an enjoyable way. It evokes the feeling that the corruption of the Time Strikers doesn't begin and end with the creatures you encounter, but also the environments they inhabit. And it narrowly avoids the ludonarrative dissonance problem purely because it makes sense within the context and absurdity of the narrative. God, I'm reading too far into this, aren't I? Whatever. It feels like some level of environmental storytelling that honestly baffled me. I didn't have high expectations, just cautious curiosity. Now I find myself lying at wake at night thinking about Chasm the Rift, like it's on the level of Plato's theory of the forms and Aristotle's rebuttal about forms leading to an infinite regress of higher and higher states of existence to the point of paradox. And I'm actually not kidding, that's the stupid part. The tech-based maps of the last episode are uncompromising and on normal will give you a taste of what to expect from the jump on hard. Because that's when enemy encounters become relentless. Enemies will teleport in mid-swarm, appear behind you, you'll chain surprise encounters sometimes, getting jumped from one angle after hitting a switch and then rounding a corner to meet an ambush or a flank situation full of rockets and lasers. If you're like me, you'll start the game off trying to dance with the enemies like Doom or Quake. By the end of it, you'll be checking corners like an obsessed madman. And that's because, on what I consider the true experience, hard, you're desperately trying to survive. Enemy hits can no longer be taken for granted. Even what seems like minor enemies such as the Warthogs will shred you apart like you're made out of cotton. And that was when it hit me. Chasm the Rift is an experiment in making a horror game. I didn't notice it until my second time through, but those two episodes that don't make any sense, they're designed to disarm you. I don't know the psychology behind the development of a fucking lizard guy with a pizza cutter launching weapon on his arm, but I think we all can agree it's patently absurd at least, and completely stupid at best. The Egypt setting in Episode 2 is dumb. It's a dumb setting for this game, and it's the lowest point of chasm, and I understand why so many people quit during the episode. I also understand that the 90s saw the growth and the mainstream adoption of the internet and when contemporary conspiracy theories started to find online communities, many of which surround Egypt as a setting and are reflected in these scientist segments that I only paid attention to on my second playthrough. So while the placement of Egypt within the context of the chasm seems to make no sense, it does function in that it will completely disarm the player as to the tone of the game as a comprehensive whole. Even Episode 3, the medieval one with the Jester, is a patently dumb idea and doesn't seem to mesh well sandwiched between the two Adam punk horror settings of the tech bases. But I eventually noticed a curve in the tone as you make progress towards the third episode's boss. The game started funneling me into tighter corridors and more uncompromising conditions. It's like a horror script. Horror formats usually begin at the height of a narrative peak, and then they slow down and build tension over time to make the climax have more punch. And in Chasm, that happens, albeit in a haphazard kind of way. The level design is about being lost in a facsimile of the real world that has been mutated by the invasion of aliens, and even the threatening nature of the aliens progresses to the more horrific over time. We can see this mirror much more quickly in the add-on content, which honestly I don't particularly love outside of, yay, more tense Chasm combat, but in three levels it escalates from a weird snow situation to a lighter version of the tension captured in the base game. Of course, it ends with another gimmick boss battle with a weird mutated wizard on the throne and is the easiest thing in the entire game, unless you let the reflector artifact run out like I did. So fuck you, Chasm Add-on. Now look, I'm not suggesting that it succeeds as an attempt at survival horror the way that Resident Evil basically coined the term a year prior. As I said, the entirety of the two middle episodes feel like David Icke fever dreams and the game probably could have been more commercially successful had the episodes between been more in theme. What I'm saying is that the unnerving designs of the alien-like Time Strikers mixed with the constant tension and brutality of the gunplay feel like an early psychological horror slash FPS blending concept. And when those elements are present, it works. 
when it's not present, it still works because there's a sense of wonder and amusement at just how fucking weird everything you're seeing is. So in short, it's not really like Quake at all, but if you want to experience Chasm the Rift in a way that is a bit more analogous to Quake, then I've got a map pack for you. Turns out Jason Mumford, the community manager for the upcoming game Salako, is also a Chasm the Rift mapper. Go figure. And he's got a pretty nice level showcase here with some intelligent mapping that, while contrasting the design showcased within the overwhelming majority of Chasm the Rift, does showcase that it could have worked as a Quake-like. Rather than extremely tight, confined quarters that choke the player off from resources and suffocate them with swarms of enemy rush, the game instead opts for a more open, arena-style encounters that allow the player to experiment with some of the game's weirder weapons. I didn't mention it, but my favorite weapon in this game is the Blade Launcher, which is a stupid weapon in concept, but it's extremely fun to use. Chasm the Rift is not Slobjank Quake. Chasm is a wonderful, weird, brutal game that oftentimes borders on unfair, and it stands on its own as a work of art in this massive pantheon of retro shooters. The remaster makes it palatable for modern resolutions, but doesn't change that much in the way of fundamentals from the DOS version, which is also included paired with pre-configured DOSBox. It's interesting, because on a technological level, I could see why nobody would choose Chasm over Quake, but it's one of those making art out of your limitation situations, because where id were literally creating the technologies to potentiate their legendary run of games, Action Forms wasn't even making a fully 3D environment, and the effects are still there in the DOS version. Papers blow in the wind, body parts still fly off. It's crazy to think about what they managed to do with the limited tech that they had.